Now, there's a huge amount of scaremongering that's going on from parts of the establishment who are looking for any excuse to stop this or to delay it. But the instruction of the people wasn't leave subject to a deal, it was leave. Leave. It's not, it wasn't even Brexit, it's actually worse than remaining in the European Union. I want a clean, proper Brexit. All right, very clean. Clear. What we need is leadership that is prepared to either negotiate a good deal or walk away. No deal, no problem, no money, we save this amount of billion and spend it back in the UK. Garbage in equals garbage out with these economic models. There's a wonderful opportunity as long as we leave the customs union because that's crucial. We can then have a free port, and free ports generate thousands and thousands of manufacturing jobs. If we have no deal, we're not going to pay 39 billion, unless our negotiators are incredibly weak, and that actually really concentrates the minds of the European Union, because if they haven't got 39 billion of our money, they are bust. Oh, come on, let's be clear. We all know in business that no deal is better than a bad deal. Of course it's true. Every business person knows that, and this is the worst deal ever in history to pay 39 billion pounds for nothing guaranteed in return please welcome to the stage richard tice <laughs> What a reception, fellow Brexiteers. Here we are in Peterborough, it's fantastic. What a place, what fun we're gonna have this evening. Hopefully, uh, you all know me, my name's Richard Tice, and uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I've been involved in setting up businesses, small, medium, and large, building thousands of homes, creating tens of thousands of jobs in the construction sector, bringing really hundreds of millions of investment into the UK economy. And yes, we all make mistakes. I made a mistake. I was a member of the Conservative Party. <laughs> I know, I know. But that's fine, because I resigned a few weeks ago. When I accepted, when I accepted the invitation to be chairman of the Brexit Party. And as you may have heard, we've been quite busy. In fact, uh, we've got a video here to show you of our launch video, uh, which we announced um, at our press conference just a few weeks ago. So hopefully if the technology works, we'll see the launch video. Maybe it won't work. <laughs> yes? No? Tech? Failing me? Ah! Oh. Well meanwhile, I want a bit of audience participation. Action! Here we go. Fail to deliver, there must be consequences. I was too young to vote in 2016, but now I support the Brexit Party because I believe in delivering on democracy. It's time to recognise that actually we are an incredible nation. This isn't about left or right. It's about standing up for our right to be heard. Successful, hardworking, so much to be confident, enthusiastic and optimistic about. That's why I'm supporting the Brexit Party. We are a single nation. We wish to remain a nation. They must adhere to the promises made to the people. Let's be optimistic. And for the benefit of our children and grandchildren, if you want a home and you're a Brexiteer, you join the Brexit Party now. We can do so much better than currently we're getting from our members of parliament. We want to be an independent, self-governing nation, making its own laws, controlling its own borders, and being proud of who we are as a people. Join us, help us, support us, do what you can for us. We need change in this country, and we need it now. Britain needs the Brexit Party, and the Brexit Party needs you. As you can see, he's back, and he means it this time. More from Nigel later. But firstly, a bit of audience participation. How many of you are registered supporters of the Brexit Party so far? Excellent. There's a few naughty people who are not yet. When you go home tonight, please sign up, join up. It's only 25 quid. Now, 
Do we believe in Brexit, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. When do we want it? Yes. I can't hear you. When do we want it? Yes. Thank you very much. Do we believe in democracy? Yes. Does Theresa May believe in democracy? No. Everyone's on message. Excellent. And of course, <clears throat> the tragedy is that Theresa May and her cabinet have humiliated our great country. Not once. Not once, but twice. She has written a begging letter to bureaucrats in Brussels asking how we can conduct our affairs and run our economy. There is nothing more humiliating than that because we've got incompetent leadership, incapable members of parliament, and civil servants who've just proven to be not up to the job. And what are they all doing at the moment? They're in the back door, they're in the back room, trying to do some dirty, dodgy, nasty deal to try and stitch this thing up. Well, we're not going to have it. We're not going to tolerate it. Because we can see what the vested interests are trying to do. And what the Brexit Party stands for is we're going to change politics for good. And we mean it. We're going to take on the establishment. We're going to take on the vested interests. We're going to take on the civil service that needs significant reform. Because what we stand for... <coughs> What we in the Brexit Party stands for is capable, competent, common sense politics that works for us, the people. We all know, and we're the only party that says this, that Brexit is a huge opportunity. It's an opportunity to be, to be embraced with ambition, with hope, with aspiration, with confidence and with belief. But of course, all of these things requires leadership, something that is completely lacking in the main two political parties. But we have that leadership. And what's been amazing also, and we're going to hear from the candidates for the eastern region of this European elections shortly, the quality of the candidates that put themselves forward decent, successful achievers, hard-working men and women who've never previously stood for public office in most cases. They actually were prepared bravely, courageously to stand up and be counted. They said, enough is enough. And the quality has been truly outstanding. And only today, we have also launched on our website that we are opening the applications for candidates to be members of parliament for the next general election because we the Brexit party <laughs> contrary to all the garbage you hear from the Twitterati and the Westminster lot we're here to stay we mean business we're going to change politics for good because this country is poised to go from strength to strength it wants competent capable members of parliament and leaders who know how to spend our taxpayers cash wisely smartly to cut out the waste the incompetence the uselessness and that's the sort of quality of people that now are prepared to put their head up above the parapet and these european elections are vital don't let anybody tell you well what's the point of voting i'll tell you there's a serious serious point ladies and gentlemen they may not have listened to us the first time but we need to send a very, very clear message back to Westminster. So tell your family, tell your friends, spread the word, your friends of friends and your friends of friends. Because everybody needs to vote in this election. Because we want to win this election, and ladies and gentlemen, we want to win it big. <clears throat> because we know we know what a fantastic nation we are. Hard-working, capable, the fifth largest economy in the world. Let's be ambitious. Let's become the fourth largest economy in the world. Why not? We can go for these things. It requires confidence. It requires belief. 
And we, ladies and gentlemen, the Brexit Party, we believe in Britain. Now, that's enough for me. The truth is, when you're chairman, actually, you just get the tough job. You're the warm-up act for all the great stars to follow. The first of which is one of the candidates for the Eastern Region, like me. I'm a candidate for the Eastern Region as well. Uh, the first is a gentleman, he's a very experienced international businessman, never been involved in politics before. He's been a chief executive and a chairman of numerous sizable companies. And he just said, like so many others, I can't stand this any longer. I've got to do something about it. It's fantastic. So before we, let's welcome Paul Hearn to the stage. Hopefully the technology will work a little bit better as we, uh, as we welcome him to the stage. Paul. Please welcome to the stage, Paul Hearn. Good evening. I feel a bit like a boxer, or perhaps like a darts player as I came up there. It's a great privilege to be here tonight, but I have to open with an admission. I voted to remain in 2016. What? Has it come to the wrong party? <laughs> so what the hell am I doing here? Well, there are three reasons why I'm here, and I hope you'll listen to me. The first of those is that I believe in democracy. <laughs> My side lost. 17.4 million people voted to leave the EU, and it is time that our parliamentarians, who think they're very clever and we're all thick, realize that everybody's vote is equal. <clears throat> My second reason is opportunity. I voted to leave because I was worried about the short-term economic consequences. I didn't believe everything George Osborne, behaving like a child with a calculator, told me about the fact that I was going to be so much worse off in 2030 and that we were going to lose hundreds of thousands of jobs overnight. But I was worried. But what's actually happened is there are more jobs in this country today than there have ever been before. Now, I would never dream of suggesting George Osborne's a liar. <laughs> but George, it didn't quite pan out how you told us it would. But far more importantly, I've finally woken up to the opportunity that's out there. The United States has made it very clear they want to do a trade deal with us as soon as possible. And they're not doing one with the EU. Our friends in the Commonwealth from Australia to India, from New Zealand to Canada, from Ghana to Kenya to Pakistan, have all said they want to do more trade with us, as have the powerhouses of Asia like China, Japan and South Korea. That's the positive opportunity that I see here before us. My third reason is actually uncertainty. Why I say that is because everyone bangs on about uncertainty if you stay, if you leave the EU. There's just as much if you stay in the EU. It's ever more centrist under Macron and the ranting for Hofstede. <laughs> EU army, single budget, same rates of taxation. I worry we'll end up, if we, if we stay here, in 10 years' time we'll be having the same arguments again, except they'll be trying to force the euro onto us. <laughs> and, and if I may, because I'm about to run out of time, if I may, to people who voted remain, and there are probably not many here, but actually people like me, I don't think that's what people like me voted for. So I hope remainers out there will think about that. Finally, the EU has not treated us well. We spend more on the defense of Europe than any other European country. Yet they have treated us like dirt, even if we haven't done a great job of negotiating. And the idea that we're all going to be friends again, and we're going to sit down with Jean-Claude Juncker and drink carrot until the middle of the night, I don't think really works. Yes, we need a close relationship with the EU for trade and security, but it not, it's not same old, same old. We need to leave and build it. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to me. That's why I'm here tonight, and we need your help to get out there and spread this message. Because as Richard said, on the 23rd of May, we need to perform powerfully and strongly so we can go to Westminster and we can say the people have spoken again. Do your duty and get us out of the EU. Thank you. Brilliant. Well done. Fantastic. Pop that. Isn't it great? There's no question. There's no question, ladies and gentlemen. He definitely now came to the right party. <laughs> um, and we announced this, this morning at a press conference in London that not only do we want to win these elections big, but the quality of our elected MEPs, their experience, their expertise, and their belief is such that actually we demand to play a significant role in the negotiating team for future negotiations. Because let's be honest, there would be, no greater, there would be no greater direct democratic mandate than for people when they vote for the Brexit party to know that actually they're putting a vote there that our experienced MEPs should then play a significant role. Because the truth is, the civil servants and the MPs who've never negotiated anything in their lifetime they tried, they had their go, and they messed it up. Useless. So it's time for us to have a go. Which brings me to my next speaker, because she's also standing as a candidate for the Eastern Region. And she is a specialist in the world of fishing, something dear to all of our hearts as an island. Because we know that the fishing industry has been completely and utterly let down, betrayed by our membership of the European Union. And, and June is a director of the lowest off fish market auctions. And she's absolutely passionate about restoring and regenerating the opportunities for coastal communities. So please give a huge welcome, June Mummery. Please welcome to the stage. June Mummery. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, Peterborough. My name is June Mummery and I own the fish auctioneers in Lowestoft, Suffolk and represent the East Coast fishing industry. Thank you. I am delighted to be running as one of the Brexit party candidates for the beautiful Eastern region. Brexit is a golden opportunity to take back full control of our waters and the fish within it. We have some of the richest fishing grounds in the world, which we are currently not reaping the benefits of. Full control of our precious ocean once again enables us to begin rejuvenating our suffering coastal communities. The fishing industry creates employment. For every one job at sea, eight more are created on land. In order to catch the fish, we will need to build ships once again. This involves draftsmen, draftswomen, shipwrights, engineers, welders, platers, electricians, just to list a few. <clears throat> we as a country have the ability. We possess the knowledge we now need to grasp this lifeline we are being presented with and so desperately need in order to rebuild a historical industry that has been forgotten about by our government, past and present. In the interest of future food security, we can feed our nation, we can self-sustain. The UK fishing industry could be worth 
$1.4 billion to our economy and has the potential to be as profitable and sustainable as the likes of Iceland, Norway and Faroe. Yeah. A staggering 80% of our fish is caught by the EU. What country would give away its ocean? Whether it's aggregates, oil and gas, renewable energy or fishing. I am determined to bring back home our fishing industry. Our seas belong to each and every one of us standing here today. It's our back garden and we would like it back! Thank you. Well, fishing aside, the biggest fight we face at present is to restore democracy, which is priceless. The people voted to leave the EU and our vote should, shouldn't be ignored. I will work hard for our region and I will not let you down. Thank you, thank you. Vote for the Brexit party. Together, let's change politics for good. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Well done. Isn't it a start? Thank you. Brilliant. Well done. Fantastic. Isn't she great? We're so lucky to have brave candidates like June with real expertise, real knowledge, and what an opportunity that we should be grasping. You know, I mean, these are ser this is a serious number of jobs. Which brings me to my next speaker, another specialist from a different sector. He's our guest speaker tonight because he's not actually a candidate, but he's a specialist in the business of pubs. Yeah. Now, I wish if I'd worked that out. Um, <laughs> amazingly, he trained as a barrister. Yeah, I know, a bit dull, he thought. So the moment he qualified, rather than say, well, I'm going to go to get a job in some law firm or whatever, he said, no, I'm going to go and buy a pub. <laughs> that was 1979, I think, and here we are, and he owns 900 pubs through his business, Weatherspoons. It's fantastic to have such a successful entrepreneur with us. Before we welcome Tim Martin to the stage, he's a passionate Brexiteer. He's given a huge amount of time, effort and hope and ambition for this cause. Let's see the video of Tim before we welcome him to the stage. Well, I think there's a bit of exaggeration going on here because you will have heard that we were going to lose four or five hundred thousand jobs in the immediate aftermath of uh, the votes. Actually, the country's created four hundred thousand jobs in the first year, more by now, I believe. The EU is 7% of the world and it puts up barriers for the other 93%. We can trade with the other 93% without the customs union tariffs which make goods expensive. At the moment the EU is a protectionist system so it charges tariffs to the 93% of the world that isn't in the EU. Well everyone here is saying that's not true. Rush and I. Well, look, we, well they're we, wrong. They're just wrong. <laughs> we at my company show anything you buy from the EU, you can buy from the rest of the world. They love to sell to us. Please welcome to the stage, Tim Martin. Someone's barred already. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Richard. Uh, what it's really about tonight, uh, uh, everyone, as we know, is democracy. Democracy works. It doesn't just work in Britain. Look how successful it's been in the rest of the world. Look at the fantastic performance of the United States in the last 200 years. The amount of freedom, the amount of wealth it's created. Poor old South America with similar 
uh, geography, and it's not the fault of the individual peoples, but it didn't have democracy, and it's had terrible problems. And look at how well South Korea's done, which is democratic, versus North Korea. And look at how Japan has done since it's become democratic. So democracy is a secret elixir for success. But the problem is the EU is becoming more and more undemocratic. Yeah. It's got five unelected presidents. It's got MEPs who can't even initiate legislation. Those things aren't democratic. And it's got a court that isn't subject to democratic control. And that eventually causes terrific problems, which they've got in Greece. It's causing the radicalization of politics, because people feel uh, they're being disenfranchised, and terrible problems. So it's amazing to have to argue the case for democracy in the UK today. But I'll tell you the weirdest thing, and it's so odd, and I don't completely understand it. That is that a lot of very highly educated people in this country, and a lot of them are in Parliament, for some reason don't feel that the public knows best. They would rather that power be transferred to people like them in Brussels. And it's crazy, because uh, uh, democracy is... Is, uh, is so potent. But p politicians, ladies and gentlemen, have been arguing about this for decades. And what they decided to do is to have a referendum. <laughs> and we won! And all we, some people say that we're hard Brexiteers, or we're extremists, or we're racist, or whatever the heck it might be. All we want to do is transfer power back to the United Kingdom. That's not extremists. But ladies and gentlemen, you and I are being subject, and the people of the UK, to a little trick. It's a little trick. It's got more spin than a Shane Warne googly. <laughs> I should have thought of an English leg break, by the way, but we haven't got any. <laughs> and that is that we can only leave with a deal. But of course, if you say you can only leave with a deal, you transfer all power into the people you're negotiating with. And the, the issue is that we don't want a deal because the deal that's on the table is awful. <laughs> it's gonna cost 39 billion quid 600 quid for every one of you here. If you've got a family of four, 2,400 for nothing. It means the continuation of, uh, of the tariffs, which are implicit in the customs union. So both the main parties, ladies and gentlemen, this is a scandal, want to keep us, well, the government and the Labour Party want to keep us in the customs union. The uh, government, Theresa May, wants to keep us in indefinitely and the Labour Party forever. <laughs> that means that we will continue to pay these hidden tariffs on New Zealand wine, on rice, on children's clothes, on thousands of things that at the moment is collected by the UK taxman on whenever you go to the supermarket and it's sent to Brussels. So we can cut these tariffs and not lose any money. I mean, what's not to like? Prices will go down. And, as the great June said, we can regain control of fishing. There isn't a snowball's chance in hell that Theresa May will uh, uh, re regain control of fishing. We all know she simply isn't capable of it, and no one else in the main party seems to be very concerned about it. Now, what people are saying, ladies and gentlemen, and this is, a, this is the real trick, is 
that no deal isn't on the table because Parliament won't vote for it. I heard a former Brexiteer, Michael Gove, say, be realistic, we have to sign Theresa's deal because Parliament won't vote for it. But I've just thought up a solution. And luckily, in a democracy, we have that solution. That is, get rid of the people in Parliament! and get a new party. Two things politicians are very, very frightened of. One is that people will support politicians at the forthcoming elections, wherever they be, uh, who, who support Brexit. So use your vote, as Richard said. The second thing is, and I'm sorry to say this in a way because I'm a free trader, is I think we should now start to use our economic power to buy British yeah. and buy non-EU. Now, I'm sorry to say that because it's, it's a... We've switched, for example, from French brandy to Australian brandy. Now, I know they're a rough bunch out there, <laughs> but it's extremely high-quality brandy. And people, believe me, uh, are very frightened of that. I know they are, because anything you can buy from the EU, you can buy from the rest of the world. That's me, what I think. Vote Brexit. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Isn't it great? We're so fortunate to have Tim's expertise, his knowledge, and that wisdom. And he says it so clearly. Just buy goods from all over the world. Simple. That is real negotiating power. And our next candidate for the Eastern region, believe it or not, is still in his 20s. Now, he studied international relations. And the first thing he realized, having studied international relations, was that we should leave the European Union. <laughs> and he's a slightly rare beast, because he works in the world of media, and he's a friend. <laughs> Unlike people at the BBC, more of them later. Um, <laughs> he's been campaigning for Brexit for many, many years. He's been a huge, huge worker for the cause. Please welcome to the stage, Michael Heaver. Please welcome to the stage, Michael Heaver. Oh, blimey, I think I'm gonna, gonna blush in a minute. I'd just like to um, start by actually paying tribute to Richard because he goes up and down the country as our party chairman. He introduces, peop yeah, introduces people. And I think actually to have an entrepreneur and a businessman speak so optimistically about the potential and the future of our country outside of the European Union, it's hugely, hugely inspiring. So thank you, Richard, and thank you for setting this party up and getting it going. Ladies and gentlemen, something very, very special is happening in our country as we speak. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Look around. This is typically the size of a party conference these days, and the Brexit party is knocking them out two and three a week. This is not normal. We are living through an extraordinary time. That's it. Raise those banners. Raise them up. You know, we're living through an extraordinary time, and why? Because we're saying we will not roll over. We won that referendum, and yet Theresa May, her language now as our Prime Minister, she talks about getting it over the line. What over the line? 39 billion for absolutely nothing. Slave state and an EU colony, and that's what Conservative MPs call it, never mind anyone else. We're not going to roll over, we're not going to accept it. And so we stand in these European elections, and we're fighting hard to win. Because, and I don't know if you've heard this guy, Nigel or something other, you'll hear from him a bit later. He gives, he gives the EU, I think, some very good advice in that European Parliament. 
once or twice they'd listened to it, whereas on the euro or the migrant crisis, they might be in a far better position than they are now, but hey. And he warned them. He's given them fair warning again. He said, if you allow these European elections to go ahead, they can expect hordes of Eurosceptic MEPs in that European Parliament. Do you know what I say? Let's not disappoint them. And I think what we've seen with these crowds and in the recent elections where we saw an extraordinary number of sport ballots, you know, people that angry, that frustrated, that they didn't just sit at home, but even just at a local election, went and sport their ballots time after time, writing the word Brexit. Well, isn't it fantastic that on the 23rd of May, you don't just have to write Brexit on your ballot paper, you can vote Brexit on your ballot paper, and we can win this election. So I hope you'll agree with me, you know, to see this party practically from nowhere to leading a national poll, several national polls, something very special is happening. And I want you all to remember, you're part of this. You are part of history. We did it in 2016. We're going to do it in 2019. We are not going to roll over. We are not going to submit. We are going to get the Brexit that we voted for. Thank you very much for your support. Brilliant. We'll take your papers. Isn't it great? Passion, enthusiasm. Which brings me on to my next speaker, who also has her own very special form of passion and enthusiasm. Now, she's had a number of phases to her career. Her first sort of warm-up phase, she spent 23 years as a member of parliament for a party that we won't mention. She then realized that actually her true calling was just about to come. And so we, she moved on to her, the second phase of her career. Yes, she taught us how to dance in Strictly Come Dancing. And, and not content with that, not content with that, she then moved swiftly on to Celebrity Big Brother. And now the third phase of her career to help the Brexit party make sure that we leave with a proper WTO Brexit. Before we welcome Anne to the stage, let's just see her on the video. We are in a complete mess. We've got the worst Prime Minister since Anthony Eden. We've got the worst leader of the opposition in the entire history of the Labour Party. And we've got the worst Parliament since Oliver Cromwell. And with that combination, we are actually engaged in the most important international negotiations for 50 years. No, let me finish this sentence, Adam, then over to you. There's a growing disengagement between the people and Parliament. So what I want is an overwhelming, an overwhelming uh, Brexit victory on May the 23rd. That That's seen. what I want. Please welcome to the stage, Anne Whittaker. Thank you very much. Now, do you think that we can remain a member of the EU and make our own laws? No. Do you think we can remain a member of the EU and control our own borders? No. Do you think we can remain a member of the EU and organise our own trade deals? No. And do you think that we can remain a member of the EU and be governed by our own democratically elected government? 
Well, those four no's are why 17.4 million people voted to get out of the EU. And when you hear those patronising nincompoops <laughs> saying that, oh dear, we didn't really know what we were voting for, those four no's are the answer. That was what we were voting for. <laughs> but what were they voting for? Well, the exact converse. They were voting to live in a country which could not make its own laws, secure its own trade deals, control its own borders, and choose its own government. What sort of Britain is that? And what I want to know is, how could they vote for that scenario? And yet, we have been comprehensively betrayed. Yeah. And it isn't just the 17.4 million who have been betrayed. It is also generations to come who, if they have their way, will not grow up in an independent, self-governing country. They have been betrayed. And the efforts, and the sacrifice, and the sheer determination of two generations ago, who fought so hard for our freedom, they also will have been betrayed. And we cannot let that betrayal take place. Now, Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn want to turn Britain into a doormat over which Juncker can tread his dirty feet, over which Barnier can stamp in whichever direction he wants to go. Instead of that, what we want is to get rid of that doormat and to leave. And and our message to them is really very simple. Either they let Britain leave or we will make them leave. And we will clear out the Augean stables that is Westminster at the moment. A parliament full of cowards. A parliament that is against democracy. A parliament that believes that its will is more important than the will of the people. Despite the fact that they promised both major parties in their manifestos in 2017 promised that they would implement the result of the referendum. Well, where is it? It simply hasn't happened, and if they have their way, it never will happen. Now, one of my most enjoyable moments after the local elections was the expression on Jeremy Corbyn's face <laughs> as he realised that far from gaining hundreds of seats, which was their pre-election boast, hundreds of seats they were going to gain as a result of their fudge. 
Instead of that, they lost scores of seats. And therefore, he is now in a very weak position. And does the Prime Minister take advantage of that? Does she say to him, right, Jeremy, this is it. Now you've absolutely got to get behind a Brexit. No. She says, oh, do you want a customs union, Jeremy? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> oh, Jeremy, do you want to stay aligned to the single market? Oh, certainly. Oh, Jeremy. You still want us to be governed by EU law? Oh, Jeremy, just tell me how much of that law you still want us to be governed by. What a nincompoop. <laughs> she has not got the leadership skills required to be a brown owl. In fact, I wonder if she has any leadership skills at all. But the one thing she doesn't have is determination to deliver what all of us here, well, with one or two exceptions, voted for. And that is her task. That is Corbyn's task. They are not doing it. OK, so we will do it for them. And it is very simple. When we have had a massive victory on May the 23rd, we will then see what happens. And if they finally deliver Brexit, all well and good. But if they don't, then we will go to Westminster and we'll deliver Brexit. It's great. On your feet. <laughs> Talk about enthusiasm, ladies and gentlemen. I, I think it's fairly... You, you know where you stand with Anne, don't you? <laughs> it's what I call no-nonsense Widdicombe. She's fantastic. Thank you, Anne. Um, but that energy, that passion is an inspiration to us all as we spread the message to everybody, far and wide. We must vote. We must send this clear message. Not only is Anne courageous, but also our next speaker is courageous. Never, ever imagined that he would be standing for election as a member of the European Parliament. Like me, he was somehow involved with the Conservative Party. I know, you know, but we've all learned. And uh, also, he knows that the scaremongering in his specialist industry of security and cyber security, all of that scaremongering is utter nonsense. Because we've got such a great range of specialists among our candidates. And to have this knowledge in the world of cyber security, Please welcome to the stage, Sean Lever. Please welcome to the stage, Sean Lever. Thank you, Richard, and thanks for putting me on after Anne Widdicombe. Um, <laughs> Anne, you're, you're a, a one-woman British institution. You're fantastic. I'm sure you'll agree. It, it's great to see so many people uh, at all of our rallies, uh, and it's great to see so many people joining online as well. We can reach a huge number of people um, on the internet. Now, I'm not a professional politician. I've never earned a living uh, from politics. As Richard said, I, I do cyber security in the day. I've worked for many high-tech companies uh, in the United States and Finland and in Israel. 
I understand how our connected world works. But I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, as someone working in cybersecurity, I'm pretty hacked off with this government. And I do have a confession to make, just between us. Until a few weeks ago, I was a member of the Conservative Party. I have been an activist, a volunteer, a donor, a local councillor, a school governor, and a former deputy uh, chairman of my association. And I've campaigned in every, gen every election since 1983. A few weeks ago, after 30 years membership, I resigned from the Conservative Party to join the Brexit Party. The world's oldest political party can no longer count on my support. And I've left. I've resigned. But why? Over the past three years, I've concluded that on the issue of European Union membership, the Conservative Party is institutionally remain. From the Prime Minister, Mrs May, most of her cabinet, the majority of its MPs, right through to its own administration. At the grassroots level where I worked, it has become divorced from the views of its own supporters and more importantly, the wider electorate. It's remain, 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 and it has to go. Over recent decades, the United Kingdom has gradually outsourced its own government to the European Union. They hoped we wouldn't notice, but I think now we have. This government's proposals will trap the United Kingdom in a supranational government in Brussels and Strasbourg, over which we have little influence, no voting rights, and from which it will almost be impossible to leave. Now, today, we hear both legacy parties are finalising the agreement for the most anti-democratic stitch-up in recent British democratic political history. It's a disgrace. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, these politicians are intent on keeping us in the European Union for as long as possible, and they'll use every method they can invent to do so. It's not what we voted for. What we are witnessing in government is not Brexit. Am I hacked off still? You bet, and I bet you are too. Some pundits will say, we didn't know what we were voting for. They are wrong. We voted to leave the European Union by a clear margin of 1.3 million votes on a record turnout of 72%. I'll tell them this is what leave means. It means self-government. It means sovereignty over our own affairs, jurisdiction in our own courts, control over we, we, how we spend and raise our own taxes, an open immigration policy fair to all, and a UK trade policy. Sounds like democratic government to me. Does it to you? Yeah. But you here in Peterborough, have already made democratic history. More than 19,000 of you, more than a quarter of the electorate, signed a recall petition to remove the MP in Peterborough, the one you no longer trust. <laughs> Using peaceful, lawful and democratic means, over six weeks you made your voice heard in that recall petition. Westminster were forced to listen to you, and now you have the opportunity to vote again. And for that, you deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there's only one political party that will implement the 2016 referendum. There is only one party that will uphold the will of democratic right and the votes that you cast counting. That party is the Brexit party. Our message is clear. If you want truly democratic government, if you want competence in office, and if you want to trust those that govern us, 
All you have to do is vote for it. So vote for the Brexit party on May the 23rd, and together we will change politics for good. Thank you, Sean. Sure. Head that way. Thank you very much, Sean. And so, ladies and gentlemen, to our penultimate speaker, someone who, whose home is near Ely, standing as a candidate again for the Eastern region, and again, brave enough to put his head above the parapet and take all the abuse, the nonsense that comes with that. Never imagined that he would be standing for public office. Another specialist, an engineer, a physicist. Please welcome to the stage, Edmund Fordham. Please welcome to the stage, Edmund Fordham. done anything like this ever before. Uh, I've never before stood for any kind of public office. My real job is being a research scientist and when speaking to an audience my usual subjects will be things like nuclear magnetic resonance or enhanced oil recovery or um, similar arcane topics. Making a political speech is very definitely a first. I'm here like all of us because I can't stand by and watch our country's foundational democratic principles being so comprehensively trashed. Yeah. For the last 24 years, I've had no political involvements whatsoever until now. But once upon a time, I was once a member of the Labour Party. Ooh. Now, that was rather a long time ago, and the Labour Party I supported was a democratic party. Its luminaries, like the late Tony Benn, not only endorsed democracy, they celebrated it. They honoured the campaigners like the Chartists and the Suffragettes, who little by little had won the vote for all adult citizens. One person, one vote, one law, that achievement used to be celebrated by the political left. There were few MPs of any party who were more consistent opponents of the European Union than Tony Benn, and upon democratic grounds. So I'd like to quote to you from what Tony Benn actually said uh, in a debate upon the Maastricht Treaty. If democracy is destroyed in Britain, it will not be by the communists, Trotskyists or subversives, but by this house which threw it away. The rights, and here is his point, the rights that are entrusted to us are not for us to give away. I cannot hand away powers lent to me for five years by the people of Chesterfield. I just could not do it. It would be theft of public rights. Well, they did throw away rights and powers in the Maastricht Treaty, and throwing away most of what's left of them is what Theresa May is doing right now. Brexit, properly delivered, gets them all back. A customs union does not. But that's exactly what Theresa May is now trying to foist upon us. She hasn't been able to get her abomination of a deal passed, so now she's cozying up to Jeremy Corbyn. Now, they do say that Tony Benn was Jeremy Corbyn's political hero. So to be true to his heritage, Jeremy Corbyn should be working for Brexit. But most of his own MPs are still in a complete thrall to the EU. They don't believe in Britain, although we do. So Jeremy is stitching up his proposals with Theresa May, all designed to keep us in a customs union, still shackled to the EU, doing whatever we're told, but with no say. And that's the best that today's Labour Party can manage for Brexit and for democracy. I think Tony Benn would probably be turning in his grave.
For those time-expired Tory and Labour parties, Brexit just doesn't compute. It's completely beyond their abilities. So what can we do about it? Those MPs in Westminster are overdue for the biggest earthquake we can possibly deliver on May the 23rd. One that leaves them quaking in their boots. They got what I'd call just a minor earth tremor last week in the local elections, but I don't think they've felt anything yet. And if they still don't get it, when we say we aim to change politics for good, we mean it. Well done. Brilliant. Fantastic. Well done. Thank you, Edmund. With that language of tremors and earthquakes, it's a very nice sort of warm-up for our final speaker this evening, who needs little introduction, but it's fair to say I can't think of any other single person who has had more impact, more influence on British politics and the direction of our country for the future than our next speaker. I've talked before about bravery and courage, and there's no question that Nigel has had to put up with more abuse, threats to his, himself and his family than any other person in politics in the last 25 or 30 years. But he's stuck at it, and the good news is, ladies and gentlemen, he's back. Yeah. And let me tell you, You may struggle to believe this, but actually, I promise you, I've got him in training. <laughs> He's never been fitter for the challenge ahead, and it's good news because he really means it. Before we welcome Nigel to the stage, let's just see him in action on the video. We have a parliament that is now completely out of touch with our country. I think politics is broken. Our task and our mission is to change politics for good. The Brexit Party has been formed because, very simply, the government and parliament do not wish to deliver Brexit. We are fighting back. The whole of our politics needs changing. The two-party system doesn't work anymore. If they thought we were going to give up, they've got another think coming. This country needs the Brexit Party, and the Brexit Party needs you. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage, Nigel Farage. And thank you for that warm welcome. I've been here before. I stood on this stage exactly one week before the referendum back in 2016. I'd been into the city, I'd walked around the cathedral. We had a big audience in the room. I shared the stage with a man called Stuart Jackson who at the time was your Member of Parliament and a devoted Brexiteer. I think, in terms of public decency, he set a rather better example than his successor, <laughs> who you 
who you decided so overwhelmingly to get rid of when 19,000 of you signed that recall petition and well done you. Well done indeed. But if there was any constituency in the United Kingdom in which trust between politicians and the people had been more broken, I can't think of one in more crisis than Peterborough. Because you see, this constituency voted by 60% to leave the European Union. Quite right that you did. And the following year, well, you changed MPs. That was a mistake, but never mind. <laughs> but you did vote for an MP, you had two choices, who said they would honour the result of the referendum. And then we saw 500 MPs vote for Article 50, which said we were leaving on the 29th of March this year with or without a withdrawal agreement. Did we leave on March the 29th? No. no. And what we've had is three years, three years of broken promises, three years of our decision being constantly watered down, three years of being told we didn't know what we voted for. How dare you, Nick Clegg? How dare you, Tony Blair? How dare you, George Osborne? How dare you, Anna Soubry? <laughs> that gets the biggest boo all over the country. Which may well indicate how wonderfully well her new political creation are going to do on the 23rd of May. They call themselves Change UK. They don't want to change a darn thing. Have you seen their logo? It looks like a Sainsbury's checkout barcode. <laughs> but what we've had from all of those people is the attempt to water down to delay Brexit. But we had a Prime Minister who stood up and told us 108 times that we were leaving on March the 29th. A Prime Minister who has told us over and over again that we take back control of our laws, our borders and our money. And a Prime Minister who has turned out not just to be the worst Prime Minister in the history of this nation, but the most duplicitous and dishonest one as well. Her withdrawal treaty is something that would only ever be signed by a government that had been defeated in war. She has reduced us to a stage of national humiliation. She has made us a laughing stock in the eyes of the rest of the world. And yet, her own gutless, spineless, career politician MPs haven't had the courage to get rid of her. Well, I've got a bit of advice here. I think if enough of us vote for the Brexit party on May the 23rd, she'll be sent packing. Let's do it. And I've been saying for the last couple of weeks, when you think about it, we have had a continuous parliament in this country for 800 years. We are the nation that developed the very idea of parliamentary democracy. We are the nation that sold that concept to dozens of countries all over the world post-1945 with decolonisation. We are the country whose parliament is known as the mother of parliaments. And yet, can you imagine if in an African country the result of an election was overturned, they'd be screaming blue murder, wouldn't they? And this morning we learned that the mayoral election in Istanbul a couple of weeks ago, in which Erdogan, the Turkish leader's candidate, did not win, guess what they're going to do? 
they're going to rerun the election. <laughs> and guess what everyone's saying? The Foreign Office are saying it's an outrage <laughs> to ask people to vote again. <laughs> Mr. Juncker! <laughs> Mr. Juncker said, which goes to show they must have caught him before lunch. Because he can't say much afterwards, believe you me. No, no, I like Jean-Claude Juncker. He makes me realise I haven't got a drink problem. It's terrific. <laughs> Bit naughty. <laughs> but Juncker says it's an outrage. Guy Verhofstadt says it's an outrage. And yet, they're all happy because they did it with the Danes over the Maastricht Treaty. They told them to vote again. They did it twice with the Irish and told them to vote again. And they all think that we should vote again. Well, let me tell you something. It would be an outrage to have a second referendum on the same question if we hadn't first implemented the result. But, but they could be even worse. Because however low I thought Mrs May and our political class had sunk, those negotiations that are going on in Downing Street right now are plumbing new depths. There is an attempt by the Labour and Conservative parties to put together a deal that would leave us trapped in a customs union, that would leave us aligned to single market rules and what the Labour Party, what large sections of it, are now pushing for is what they call a confirmatory referendum. Doesn't that sound nice and fluffy? And what they mean by that is a choice to vote for the existing European treaties or for Mrs May's new treaty, which in many ways is arguably worse than continued membership of the Union. They are trying, large swathes of our establishment are trying to take a real Brexit off the table. And let me tell you something. I did not spend 25 years of my life fighting and arguing that we should be a free, independent, self-governing, proud nation that reaches out to our real friends in the world. I didn't fight for that for 25 years to simply give up because our politicians don't respect the result of the referendum. And I got things wrong. I thought after that win, after that general election, after that vote for Article 50, I thought this was done because I thought we lived in a democratic country. I've learnt that we don't live in a democratic country and I made a promise that if I had to return to the front line of this, then next time I said it would be no more Mr. Nice Guy, and I meant it. <laughs> this fight now, this fight now is about far more than just leaving the European Union. This is a full on battle against the establishment and the vested interests in this country. We need to change politics for good in this nation. And they may, they may well still underestimate us, but look what the Brexit party has achieved in the space of four weeks. Four weeks ago, we appeared like a jack-in-the-box. And look at the calibre and quality of people I'm sharing this platform with. People from every walk of life. People from differing political backgrounds. We are fighting, ladies and gentlemen, for the very principle of whether we're to be a democratic, free nation. This is not about left or right. 
It's about right or wrong. And we have right on our side. This is about how the rest of the world sees us. It's about our future. I, I love Anne's phrase. Either we leave the European Union meaningfully or we have to make them leave. And I now am beginning to think that even if we do sweep the board on the 23rd of May, they still won't listen. I'm of the view that if they did force upon us a second referendum, and it was a reasonable question, and we voted to leave again, I still don't think this government and this parliament would actually deliver it. Now, I know it's tough in Peterborough. You keep being asked to vote. <laughs> you voted 19,000 of you to get rid of your last MP. You voted again last Thursday. And we're asking you to go out and vote again on the 23rd of May. But I am not asking you to go out on the 23rd of May and simply stick two fingers up to the establishment much as they deserve it. Now I'm asking you to become part of a movement, a movement that will fundamentally change British politics, a movement that not only will get us out of the European Union, but a movement that will break the current two-party system which serves nothing but itself. We need to update and modernise our democracy in this country. We need to start being proud of who we are as a nation. And we can do this. Already, 88,000 people in the space of four weeks have signed up they're £25 to become registered supporters of this party. That's a commitment that people have made. And I would ask the over half of you in the room that have not done it to think of it in these terms. Joining up, signing up to the Brexit party is the best investment you can ever make in the future of our great nation. So I need, and I hope I can, can I ask you, are you with us? Yes. Will you take this message out to your friends and family where you live, not just for this European election or the Peterborough by-election or indeed the next general election in which we will contest every single seat? Will you stand and fight with us? Yes. Give me a board. Will you help us change politics for good? Thank you very much. As I said, he's back. And it's quite clear that he's really just warming up. We've, we've just got time for a few questions. Um, and to give Nigel a breather, uh, the first one... Uh, Anne. Actually, there's a real compliment for you from another Anne from Rutland. She says, after all the years in the Tory party, why doesn't Anne have a peerage? It's a very good question. Well, I will wonder. Don't answer it. <laughs> I'll answer it. I don't mind answering. It's because David Cameron didn't like me. <laughs> but don't worry. I didn't like David Cameron. <laughs> so, oh dear. Um, it's going well. Um, Nigel, uh, Steve from Peterborough says, what do we do if the Labour and the Tories sell us out with a dodgy deal? Well, they're trying to as we speak, aren't they? Um, I, I have to say, 
The one thing they cannot stop is this European election happening on May the 23rd and that David Liddington chap um, said as much in Parliament this afternoon. I say chap, you probably don't even know who he is, he's so insipid, but there we are. Um, <laughs> So one thing they can't stop is the European elections from happening. What they say they might be able to stop is us from taking our seats. But hey, every single promise she's made has been broken. We were leaving on the 29th of March. We didn't. We were leaving on the 12th of April. We didn't. We were going to leave by the 30th of June. We're not. Now we're going to leave on the 31st of October. Halloween. Trick or treaty. All I can tell you is, if they did somehow get a parliamentary majority for a permanent customs union and alignment with single market rules, they would have formed a coalition against the people of this country and they have no idea of what the consequence would be. And frankly, frankly, in those circumstances, I think the Brexit party would do extraordinary things in the next general election. Anne, Tracy from Kettering. If the MEPs win their seats, what good can they do inside the European Union? An awful lot. What's he been doing? inside the European Union. And that's what we'll all be doing inside the European Union. Nigel, just before we finish, Rob from Nottinghamshire. What happens? How do we change politics for good after we win the Euros? Uh, we do it by using the 23rd of May as our springboard, our springboard to parliamentary by-elections, our springboard to the next general election. And what I want to do, I want us to find 650 people of the calibre, the honesty and the life experience that we've got on this stage with me this evening. And if we do that, and if you, the public, decide you want to help us and support us, we can change things. I know that it's difficult to change things under the first past the post system. No man alive knows that more than me. But if ever there was a moment when real fundamental change in politics could happen, where we could replace this hopeless, dishonest political class, it is in the wake of this the greatest democratic betrayal in the history of our nation. The time to change things is now. So, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to an end. But I think we need you all on your feet. With your placards, please. Let's, have, let's send a massive message to everybody in Peterborough and down to Westminster. What do we want? Brexit. Brexit. When do we want it? Now. now. What do we want? Brexit. Brexit. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Brexit. When do we want it? Now. now. Thank you very much indeed. Have a very safe trip home.